Hi, Steve Van Meter here, and welcome to your weekly economic update where we take about 30 minutes every Friday trying to make sense of markets that really don't make much sense. You know, after all, how is it you can get five consecutive months of declining manufacturing output in the United States? Five consecutive months. It's gone worse and worse and worse, five months in a row, and investors buy stocks. How does that make any sense? I mean, do they do they really believe? Do they really believe that the Fed is going to wave their magic wand, which they've been doing now for several months? And it's all going to just poof and magically fix itself. Well, apparently they do, because they're putting a persistent bid under stocks. the The other reason is, you know, again, it's, it's not just investors believe in the Fed. They believe. I mean, they're investing without a parachute. You know, virtually no security in their portfolio. They totally believe in the Fed. But it's not just that. And you know, we got a report um, a couple of weeks back or so from Nomura, who maintains some quant computers. They're not the only one game in town, but they have these quantitative computers and they are what are called trend following. So they look at the last week and month and three months, six months, and, and have some formula and tells them whether to buy or sell. And they have different ones for stocks and bonds and all kinds of other things. But the stock ones in the report that came out said, when you see the market dip and get immediately bought, that's the quant computers. They said the trend is up, so you buy. It's up, buy, up, buy. So buy every dip. It's going to be really interesting to see the fourth, fourth quarter uh, data come out for earnings because the market is completely priced in something that is not happening. But yet again, five consecutive months of declining manufacturing data and people buy stocks. You got me. Doesn't make any sense. Anyway, so the topic at hand this week is it's a very, very long report, uh, probably double the length of my normal reports. For those of you who have no idea what I'm talking about, every Friday I publish reports emailed out to my clients. Uh, but for those of you who are not clients, you can go to my website at stephenvanmeter.com, to my Facebook page, or to my LinkedIn page, and you will find that same report that you can read. And it talks about, uh, or I wrote about, why the big banks are buying bonds. And, and we touched on this Monday, that there's a lot of regulatory requirements since the a great financial crisis where the banks have to buy an increasingly amount of capital. Again, if we, as we touched on Monday, regulators didn't think it was exuberance or excessiveness or over leverage that caused the financial crisis. They really think it was the banks didn't have enough liquidity. Well, how do you solve a problem that, well, it wasn't really the problem. It was partly, it was, the banks didn't have the right amount of liquidity and they didn't have enough of it and it only made the problem worse. But how do you create or force the banks to get the right amount of liquidity. Well, you penalize them, essentially. You give them some new rules and regulations to follow. And it says, hey, if you're a bank of this size, then you need to have this much liquidity. And oh, by the way, underneath the covers, if you have a bunch of garbage assets, well, you need some more liquidity. And oh, you got some stuff that's even worse than that. Well, you need some more liquidity. And we're going to give you some scoring mechanisms and whatnot to determine just how much liquidity you need. And the liquidity we're going to encourage you to hold well, our government securities, you know, particularly U.S. government securities and mortgage-backed securities. Now, why would that? Why would a regulator do that? Why would they want banks to buy uh, government securities, particularly U.S. government securities? I'm not saying they, when, a lot of this. I'm referring to. I'm talking about the U.S. banks. I mean, the European banks and Asian banks are, are follow the same rules, but we would apply perhaps uh, their debt to this as well as U.S. government debt. So, so European banks might be buying European debt in addition to U.S. debt. Now, why would you do that as a regulator? Because what can the Federal Reserve buy an unlimited quantity of? U.S. Treasury securities and mortgage-backed securities. So if the banks have it and there's a recession and there's a liquidity crunch, which there will be, what can the Fed do? They can come and say, here's effectively a blank check. We'll take everything you got and we'll pay, oh, not just, we'll pay whatever price we need to pay. You know, market value, no problem, above market, what doesn't matter, you need dollars, we have a check, here you go. So the, the central banks essentially created an out for the next financial crisis. Now, it doesn't mean it'll work. It just means 
they, what they perceive the problem is, they've created a solution for it. Now, in addition to all these regulations, there is a, the global systematically important bank score that is tallied at the end of every calendar year now. And depending on where you rank, you get an, an additional penalty. And there's 30 banks sitting on that list right now. Uh, many of them, uh, I think there's five or six U.S. banks. So it's, it's, it, you're not exempt. It just means the bigger you are, the more likely you are to be on this penalty list. And the, one of the challenges going into the end of the year was if you hold government securities and the stock market is up, you want to shed those government securities if at all possible. At least that's what people who understand how the scoring mechanism works. This is a problem because, of course, you have banks that needed liquidity or needed collateral and they needed to buy government securities, which is why when we look at the reports, they've been buying so many government bonds. I mean, I like $100 billion worth uh, over the last, say, 12 months or so. So they've been buying lots and lots and lots of government bonds. And it doesn't make sense. Why would they, you know, in the last two or three weeks of the year, just dump them because of some score. Now, of course, the central bankers know that and the Fed knows it, which is why, as I believe, and we're starting to see in the data today, uh, is that the Fed created an out for the banks to shift some of those treasury securities and mortgage backed securities to the Fed balance sheet without dumping them on the market, only to have them a shift back as we see in the Fed report today that they're gonna start to rein in some of this liquidity here later this month, starting, in fact, starting next week where we would expect to see those bonds shift back to the bank balance sheets where they need to be. So the Fed essentially tried to game the system that they agreed as part of the, of the global central banking consortium and all the regulators that would be a good idea for the banks. Pretty slick, right? But what did we see in December because of this uh, GSUB score and the reports that came out about it, we saw there was some selling by European banks. And we did see a report by a guy who works for Credit Suisse by the name of Pozar, who was an expert in the G-sub scores and repo markets and all this stuff, say, hey, banks are selling, going to be selling their bonds. And I think he may have referred to his bank and maybe some other banks in Europe that he knew about, but certainly didn't see that in the US bank. So my theory was that in January, that persistent selling would disappear. And it did. I mean, literally January 2nd, we were no longer seeing European markets open and a persistent sell of treasury securities. It went away. And now all of a sudden, we're starting to see a rise in bond prices. And again, why is that? Because the banks need to buy a boatload of these things. It's not like they just get some and they're done. No, they need to continuously add more and more and more bonds. And then the Fed is also buying $60 billion per month of treasury bills. So what is going to happen? Why, we, why is it when we look at the charts and you see a, a, a drop in treasury yields and you see a rebound and then you see a big plunge? Because there's a point at which the economy falls under the weight of the Fed's prior tightening cycle, which is lagged by somewhere between 18 and 24 months. And when the time comes for all these investors who have crammed into equities, and have taken out no portfolio insurance in the form of U.S. Treasuries, by the time they realize they need it, the supply of Treasury securities on the open market is thin. It's really thin. And that's why you get such a big surge in bond prices because everyone's scrambling for bonds and nobody wants to sell them because that's your insurance policy. Well, eventually the smart money and those who own bonds do sell not after they've made a whole ton of money. So let's take a look at some of the various charts and data we've got for this week. Uh, we're going to cover how the hedge funds are positioned only because that data is due to the holiday weeks is coming out on Mondays and or I'm sorry, Tuesday, we get it. Uh, that will clean itself up here in two weeks. But for now, uh, we're going to look at last week's data today. We would have looked at it on Wednesday, but obviously it was New Year's. Uh, so the growth rate of the money supply um, is now starting to trend lower at 7.11% from last year. Six-month rate of change still running very hot compared to normal conditions at 4%. Three-month rate of change is running at 2.12. Um, this really hasn't done much. There is a lag here between the money supply and the economy. But this is just showing that there is money building up to be used. And how do we know that? Well, we can go and look. Oops. 
Let me load up that slide for you. So here is the weekly money stock data, and you can see in institutional money funds, you can see this is building up over the period of last year. Now, if we click on that, it opens up a new slide, and you can see here is institutional money is going up into recession. So you can see it's starting to move higher. And then what happens out of recessions, where does that money come out and go to? Usually stocks. And one of the things you can overlay, I think we've done this in the past, is 10-year treasury yields. So let's do that and we'll add that to the graph here and we'll slide it over so it's there and you can say i don't notice a real relationship between the two and that's because you have to invert one of them and if you invert the money going into money market there it goes what you suddenly find out is all this money moving into cash puts downward pressure on treasury yields. And so it supports the view that you, treasury yields are likely to head a whole lot lower. And you can see it right there. You can see cases here where yields have kind of bucked the trend, but money flowed into money markets and yields collapsed because there are people that are actually selling their stocks right now. I know that sounds crazy and, and very hard to believe, um, but that is actually uh, happening. All right, let's go back to the slide. Real estate lending growth uh, was up 4.05%. Now, you know what? We should have, while well, I was on that chart, we should go to, there we go. Now, let's look at the assets and liabilities of commercial banks, and then we'll go through um, the data that I um, adjusted for that. And you can see securities and bank credits. So this is bonds. Uh, actually went up a billion dollars kind of so what what happened was the banks need to sell or transfer to the feds balance sheets some of their treasury securities and mortgage-backed securities and they did they went from a peak of uh, 3.857 trillion down to 3.811 trillion so you can see they scaled that back down uh, roughly by a little less than 50 billion dollars <laughs> <clears throat> Excuse me. And where do we see that breaking down? You can see in mortgage-backed securities, they shed quite a bit of it, came out of the mortgage-backed securities. They didn't prune too much, but they did prune some of their treasury bonds and then their other securities. So we could see that, but it did not have the major impact in the bond market that you would expect from unwinding $50 billion of bonds off bank balance sheets. So it was how we kind of know it went to the Fed. But if we look at, at the lending data, so the total loans and leases actually went down 2 billion. And you look, commercial industrial loans, this is a big drop of, uh, not only was this revised lower by 2 billion, but it was dropped, then fell 10 billion uh, over the last week. And that's significant. Now, maybe this will be revised higher, but this is telling us bad, bad things. Because you look back, it's and back in May, there's virtually no change. And I said, this thing is going to zero out and it's never, <coughs> excuse me, zeroed out, not until after we're deep into a recession. So real estate lending is keeping the market going. That rose about $6 billion. Uh, consumer loans were up, um, maybe with holiday spending. And uh, for the boy who sells Audis, well, unfortunately, automobile was only up slightly. Probably much to his disappointment, but he did make his quota for the year. So that um, makes him happy. Uh, all right, going back to the charts. So we have real estate lending was the growth rate ticked up to 4.05%. Real estate market is really holding everything together, but it's not historically very strong. I mean, it's, we're not seeing a lot of loans. We're seeing a, lot, a large generation of the boomers who do have loans that are paying down or paying off their homes. So the six month rate of change is is whole, is falling slightly at 1.86%. The three-month rate of change is at 0.96%. So there's not a lot of strength here for how much interest rates have actually dropped. And it tells you the same story that I've said over and over is that interest rates need to go down. So let's take a look at commercial industrial lending. Big drop in the growth rate went from almost three down to 1.62%. And you can see this thing does not contract until we're already in a recession. So this would be the potentially the first time we see a contraction and we haven't had one, which means that it will be very, very bad when we do. And, and 
why does this matter? For those of you who are new to the video, it's real simple is the way the economy or the monetary system creates money is through lending. You know, the Fed doesn't create money despite all the, you know, even when I say, well, the Fed's printing, the Fed really can't print money. There, there are laws in place to prevent that. The only, only way money is created in our monetary system is through the banks when a new loan is originated. So, if, so think about this. If new loans are being created, originated, new money is coming in the economy. So what happens when there is a contraction in lending, then when there's fewer loans, that means money is being destroyed. And in a debt-based economy, the destruction of money is like the worst thing that can happen. You, you want to avoid it at all costs. So how do you fix it? Got lower interest rates. It is the only solution. So looking at the six-month rate of change, it is negative. Looking at the three-month rate of change, it is also negative at 0.32%. When I went back and looked at the past two recessions, when the three-month rate of change prints minus one, doomsday is, is already there. And I'm we haven't gotten there. But if this last week wasn't in any indication, unless this, unless some somehow commercial industrial only starts to pick back up here in January, maybe it will. But if that is a trend of this thing going down, bigger problems are coming quick. And total loans and leases uh, were uh, t the growth rate was down to 4.0 or 4.20 percent from last year, but the and the six and three month rate change were virtually flat with just very slight slight upticks. But again, the total loans and leases this chart represents one third of all loans and leases in the country. It's historically running well below trend and rolling over. So this is not a good sign at all. But consumers did uh, tap their credit cards and uh, uh, obviously for the holidays, the growth rate went up to 4.74. So we're seeing a shooting up that there's a positive trend for the economy, but we still got a little ways to go before we say that they're uh, the consumer is back. Uh, this again, it could just be a holiday effect here. It, there, you don't see that every time in the data. Um, I mean, here you see in 20, you don't see it in 2018, any rebound there, but you do here. Uh, the question is, will it hold? So as we look at interest rates, there's going to be a lot of things. I want to revisit this slide. Just, you know what? Actually, yeah, I want to revisit how just how deep the short position is. Because when we look at how the head funds are positioned, this, this slide is not something that gets updated very often. I don't have it. I can't make the people that do it uh, updated if I wanted to. But what we do know is yields got up to 2.4% on the 30-year treasury. And they're now reversing. I think they're under 2.3 as of to close of business today. And this is looking at the total number of speculative contracts in the total treasury futures bond market from all the way from short term to long term. And you can see there's just a lot of people betting on higher interest rates. And the more bets you get, the bigger the unwind is. Remember, we went from 3.5% on the 30 year to 1.9 and we only unwound up to here. Well, now they got to the same, nearly the same level of shorts. Maybe they're back there now because this is chart is a couple of weeks old and they only pushed it up to 2.4, suggesting the next unwind when this deep of red goes to green is going to be substantial and most likely where we see treasury yields get to near 0%. And darn it, I did not mean to close that. Um, I'll open it up in the background here. Okay, so let me switch over to, <coughs> excuse me, back to these charts over here. We got the NASDAQ McClellan summation index, the uh, proxy liquidity, just uh, the market is just fighting liquidity higher. Anything to drive straw prices up It's becoming very apparent that the U.S. economy is the stock market and the U.S. economy is weakening and investors are driving stock prices higher. They don't seem to be concerned about that. But let's take a look at how hedge funds are positioned. And look, we can see 10-year treasuries, they took it, they deepened their short position. So that chart that we just looked at was a couple weeks old. So you can see over the past couple months, they increased their short positions on 10-year treasuries. This is gonna be relevant when I eventually get to the charts. Let's look at 30-year yields, where we can look and say over the past, Four weeks, eh, four to, to six weeks, but really over the last four weeks, they deepened those short positions. They really increased them. And you can see looking back to the former all-time low where they started increasing their short positions, they held that and then went crazy deep here. So you have near record short position in 30-year treasury yields or bonds and, and increasing in 10-year. 
This is important to know. So we'll look at oil. Investors are crazy in crude oil. Had a big draw this week, but a big product build. Now, I've heard rumors, and I've not had the chance to confirm this, that it's not unusual at the end of the year for oil companies to try to make barrels disappear for either accounting or tax purposes. Don't know what if it's one or both reasons. And that got shoved into massive product builds in, in distillates, which is diesel fuel, jet fuel, and big builds in gasoline. So it's just telling us that the economy is not chewing up all of that product. So that means the economy isn't as strong as advertised. And so hedge funds increased their uh, long positions in the S&P 500 as it looks to be peaking. Uh, their wildly long gold, wildly long. And I, I said this at lunch today, that gold will come down because when the market gets unwound, the hedge funds will be forced to sell gold to hedge their other positions. What happened in you know, 08 and 09? Go back and look. NASDAQ, back, uh, they increased their long position slightly. The Russell, they're still fairly long on small caps, backing off their, their dollar longs. The dollar should be rebounding. I haven't looked at it today. And they're backing a bit off their volatility short positions, but the overall market is extremely short volatility, extremely short, and a big unwind here would send stock prices lower. Let's take a look at the four-week moving average of initial jobless claims, which is starting to move higher. Now, you can't maybe tell here, but we'll zoom in. And you can see since 2018, it's pretty much plateaued and now starting to rise. And when this thing starts to rise at the end of a cycle, it pretty much tells you that's it. So what this means is of uh, the last four weeks of initial claims, jobless claims are starting to rise. It'll be very interesting to see what happens with uh, the holidays being over if companies start to let people go. We know the manufacturing sector is, is weakening, so we will expect uh, when the next payroll report comes out to, to see fewer manufacturing jobs. But what does this mean for treasury yield? Well, it means quite a bit. And you say, well, I, I kind of see some relationship there. Let me help you with that. Let's invert this a little bit. And when you see these two together, maybe, maybe I didn't click on it. There it goes. So when jobless claims start to rise or fall, because they're inverted here, where do you think treasury yields go? They go down, why? It's very simple, people that do not have jobs cannot borrow, at least Last time I was at the bank, I asked him, do, do people get loans and don't have jobs? No. Well, re they said retired people can, but you don't have any income. No. Uh, construction spending increased for the second month in a row with the year-over-year -year change just ever, oops, uh, running back into positive territory, meeting back up with uh, the non-farm payroll report. So that kind of, it, it tells us that this coming non-farm payroll report should show fewer jobs created but maybe not as much as this big dip here did. It could, but maybe not. So the positive sign for the jobs market is construction spending increased a little bit. As we look at foreign, oh, I will do that last. And then treasury deposits at Federal Reserve Banks against 10-year treasuries. So we're getting to a point now where we had this big jump in borrowing to fill up the treasury coffers. And now this should be increasing here like we've seen in the past, where it just should be on a gradual increase. But from a perspective and in interest rates, as money gets pulled in and held in the, uh, the coffers of the U.S. Treasury, that money is not cycling back into the economy. When it doesn't cycle back in the economy, interest rates go down. Oh, there you see it. I don't know why the chart wasn't updating properly uh, or sliding all the way over. But there you see it's kind of, it's kind of getting up there and should start to go sideways. And that means that money is not coming back. It's going to stay in there for a while. Again, tells you that treasury yields should go lower. Now, last one, we want to talk about world dollar liquidity. And we look at this chart to say that, yes, world dollar liquidity is still in contraction. But what does it really mean in terms of how many dollars the Fed destroyed? And it's not intuitive by looking at a chart that way. But what you can see is going back to 2014, where world dollar liquidity peaked at uh, $4 trillion, it's now down to $3.2 trillion. So they really contracted world dollar liquidity. And what eventually happens, and you're starting to see some of it now, where companies will just, fight, they just, they're just bankrupt. One day they look like they're okay, and the next day they're bankrupt. Because there never is enough dollars in the economy 
to pay for all the debt. There, there isn't. I mean, if everybody in the world that held dollars went and paid off every amount of debt they could pay, and those who didn't have any debt paid off everyone else's debt they could pay, there would still be debt and not enough dollars. So when the Fed destroys or contracts dollar liquidity as the world's reserve currency, what slowly happens is you get debt defaults until the thing snowballs into a recession where a lot of companies are short dollars. So think of it like musical chairs, right? There's so many dollars and there's more debt circling around those dollars. And at some point the music stops and everyone sits down and somebody loses. Well, there, point, there will be a point where there's one chair, lots of people circling and poof, that's how it, be, how it happens. And if you look at commercial industrial lending and you see that it's nearly flat on a 12 month basis, it's a giant, giant, giant red flag. All right, let's go look at the charts. I wanna mainly look at uh, this chart of, whoops, treasury bonds. Now, I'm, I'm gonna, you know, this is technical analysis school, but for those of you that are a lot more savvy, you'll say, well, you didn't draw the line in the right exact spots. I know, I'm not trying to draw anything in the exact right spots. I'm just trying to illustrate a concept. Some people don't believe that you can learn something just by looking at price charts. But in this case, you can. So what you have is a triangle pattern. And see this cayenne line is the uh, long end of the triangle. And then you have the bottom. And then here's uh, the right angle of it. So what happens is sellers, you can see here, sellers, sellers, sellers. And buyers have been roughly where this purple line is. So when you see, when it gets down here, the buyers are like, hey, I want to buy in this range. And they start buying prices. Hey, I want to buy here. And they bid price up. And I want to buy and I'm pushing prices up. So what sellers are trying to do from, from a technical position is they're trying to break the will of the buyers. So they keep trying to push prices, you know, get down to this purple line, push below. Can they get below? Can they get, can they, what they're trying to do is run the buyers out of money. That's what they're trying to do. The buyers, on the other hand, are trying to exhaust those who want to sell. Okay, that's the game. Think of it, you know, it's just a bow. One side versus the other. One side's trying to exhaust the other side. So when we got down here, we're getting near the end of the triangle. And normally what happens is one side starts to prevail. Now, if the sellers would have driven prices down, that would imply that those who bought in here and here would turn into sellers and give up their positions and interest rates would spike and bond prices would collapse. But when you have large commercial banks buying bonds and the Fed buying bonds and the large commercial banks needing to buy more bonds, what happened is you can see here in December is that report from Credit Suisse got people to sell bonds. Maybe people that weren't planning on it, they started selling bonds and trying to drive price down and it didn't work. And now what's happened is you, you get some bad economic news. You get you know a, a missile strike or whatever the... Whatever the I don't know exactly what they're calling the thing at Iran today. I didn't really pay much attention to the, the technical words. But anyways, you get some information that says maybe the economy isn't so good and some uncertainty coming. So why does this triangle matter from technical analysis? Well, let's go back and look. You see sellers in here, sellers here, sellers here, and sellers up here. So as prices of bonds rise, it starts to squeeze these people out who have sold. Now, what we know is over the last four weeks, the hedge fund managers have increased their short positions. Well, that would be roughly somewhere here in December. So the hedge funds went deep in their short positions during this period right here. We also know, even though they just are in a speculative position, that they're also normally will come in and they will chase their position in this, what's called the cash market. So they'll take a bet here. I'll bet, in, I'll bet bond prices are going to go down and I'll put a lot of money on that. And then I'm going to make them go down by selling. So what happens is as bond prices rise above this downward sloping triangle, is it starts to put the squeeze on these people that are short. And they start looking and say, hey, I'm losing money and I'm losing money in hedge funds who are, what are generally make changes to their views very quickly, decide to exit their short positions and you see bond prices rise. Now the next stage for this would be to see as this continue to rise up until this dotted purple line where we've seen two batches of selling. So if prices can push through here, we'll see that these sellers will turn into buyers. And that's the key is 
either when they either exit those speculative positions or when they're sh uh, stopped out of their short positions, they inadvertently or directly become buyers. So then you start to get some momentum here on prices rising. So the next stage is for it to break through here. And then the next stage is up here. And that's why this pattern matters is because all it's telling you is where the short positions are really at. And there's a lot right here at the dotted purple line and then the next stage is up here, and then you have the all-time high. So sometimes what you'll see in technical analysis is when prices break above the triangle, people get excited about it, and they'll wanna pile in because they're going to try to squeeze the short sellers out. What that's telling us is right in here, the sellers just didn't have enough gusto or enough ammunition to beat the buyers out. And if they can't beat the buyers out, well, then they're going to become buyers. So hopefully, uh, that makes uh, some sense to you. And we should, at least as far as I expect, to see more, uh, see the bond market continue to rally. And I expect to see the, the large commercial banks start to pick up some of those bonds they sold and continue to add to them because, as you'll read about this week, they need to add a lot of high quality collateral. I'm Steve Van Meter. Thanks for watching. We'll be back Monday. Uh, we won't be talking about hedge funds because I don't think we'll have that date until Tuesday. So we'll look at that Wednesday, but I'm sure we'll have something interesting to take a look at. Until then, the content of this video is provides educational information only. It's not intended to provide investment or other advice materials not to be construed as a recognition or solicitation by a seller, security, financial or instrument, or participate in any particular trading strategy. This video was paired by Steve Van Meter. I'm own personal capacity opinions expressed in the video that I'm own and do not reflect the view of Atlas Financial Advising or Steve Van Meter Financial.